Our story begins at a women's college in Massachusetts. A student gets home from class, and there's an intruder waiting for her. Attacked by the stranger, the girl is then rushed to St. Agnes Hospital. It turns out that this is only the latest of a series of similar attacks. Professor Andy Safian is talking about that problem with Detective Donna Harris. He complains about the lack of security on campus, but Dana says there's only so much she can do. In the operating room, the situation is tense. Dr. Matthew Robertson fears it might be too late to help the girl. But the surgeon in charge is a new guy, Dr. Jed Hill. He manages to save her and dazzle his colleagues with his expertise at the same time. Before leaving the room, he says it feels good to be part of their team. However, that sweet smile is hiding a darker side to the good doctor. After the surgery, Matthew approaches him to praise his performance, admitting that he was wrong to contradict him. Jed speaks to him with a very menacing tone. He says diverging opinions are welcome, but never during major surgery, especially if his opinion is that they're about to lose the patient. He says Matthew will regret it deeply if he ever does anything like that again. Andy is the next one in line for a chat, but this one is much more pleasant. He wants to thank him for saving the student's life. While talking, he realizes they went to high school together. Jed doesn't remember him because he was the cool kid while Andy was more of a nerd. Also, a brief interruption by a nurse named Tanya shows Andy that Jed is still at hit with the ladies. Andy, on the other hand, is happily married now. Tracy is a preschool teacher, which makes us think their household is not exactly wealthy. Telling her about Jed, the man himself appears to join them in the elevator, wearing a suit that puts his former classmate right in his place. Dr. Sullivan is organizing a welcome reception for their star surgeon. Andy and Tracy are invited, but she is quick to say they already have plans for lunch. And those plans are actually just what we predicted, complaining about lack of money. Shocked to hear the estimated budget for the plumber, Andy declares he'll do the job himself. Tracy sees it as an opportunity to pitch her idea about the third floor of the house for a few months. That's how we can tell this is the 90s. These people here actually own a place that has a third floor, but Andy finds it weird to share his home with a stranger. The recent attacks have made him a little suspicious of everyone. He also makes her promise that her friend Helen will drive her home tonight. Hours later, he is watching from the window as she arrives. And guess what? That is not Helen. He tries to inquire about it jokingly, but she spots his jealousy right away. She says the gentleman is Dennis Riley, her mother's lawyer. He needed her to sign some papers about her mother's estate. Now Andy's curiosity has a layer of greed too. What kind of inheritance are we talking about here? Tracy says it's little more than pennies, but still generates paperwork. Andy decides to drop it before she calls the guy for divorce papers or something. Not that she's too mad, really. Right after that, he's having some Chinese food in bed when she comes to grab a spring roll for herself. But then, Andy stops abruptly to kill the lights. Tracy is puzzled by that, being Nicole Kidman and all, but her husband actually has a good reason. From the neighbor's window, a creepy boy is watching them once again. Days later, Jed stops by the house while Andy is struggling with the renovation. Get a Victorian house, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Jed reveals that he's keen on architecture, and he also seems impressed by a digus that Tracy inherited from her dad. They go out for lunch and catch up. Andy says it's been hard lately, with the attacks on campus and the house falling apart. Also, they've been trying for a baby with no success. Jed is having no such problems, of course, but he could use some help finding a place. One thing leads to another, and Andy decides to rent that third floor to him. To his surprise, Tracy hates the idea. She thinks Jed is an arrogant bully. But the truth is Andy wants Jed's professional opinion about the baby business. Dr. Lillian Field, the obstetrician she's been seeing in Boston, might not be working for them. Trying to explain himself, he lets it slip that he may have shared some of her medical issues with Jed. Once again, Tracy's anger is very short-lived. 
the lady is a forgiver. And apparently, so is Andy towards his students. A girl named Paula blames her alarm clock for missing her finals, and he pretends to fall for that. But his attitude is very different when he's talking to Dana Harris. She comes by to let him know that they have no decent leads about the attacks. Andy makes sure to show his disappointment. He also mocks the idea of giving out more pamphlets as a solution. And then a particular detail is mentioned about the campus predator. He's been cutting each victim's hair, and then he takes it all with him. At night, Tracy overhears the neighbor talking to her son. The woman is a nurse who works the night shift, and the boy is that junior purr from the upstairs window. His name is Billy. But the apprentice voyeur is soon out of her mind, as she has bigger fish to detest. Just as she feared, Jed is an obnoxious tenant, always disrupting their lives more than necessary. Andy can't help but envy his friend's vitality. Even after entertaining one of the nurses all night long, the guy is still up early to go jogging. Tracy remains unimpressed. At work, Andy can't believe that Paula has missed another exam. He asks the secretary to call her, but nobody answers. He decides to pay her a visit then. Because that's what professors do with their time, right? To be fair, Andy is already developing a paternal instinct, and it's not such a bad idea to check up on her. That paternal side of him takes a heavy blow when he finds some blonde hair on the floor and sees the back door open. In the front yard, there's a shoe to point in the right direction to a terrible discovery. When the cops arrive, he can't even bring himself to talk to Dana properly. Trying to drown that horror in booze, he goes to a bar with Jed. Not a good choice. The doctor seems to think this is a good time for insensitive quartz jokes. When Andy decides to call it a night, Jed stays at the bar with a couple of pretty girls. The next day brings a very unpleasant surprise to Andy. All three victims had come to see him before they were attacked, and that makes him a suspect now. Dana believes that he is innocent, but her personal opinion won't hit the judge the same way as a good old sperm sample. Meanwhile, Tracy is having another episode of severe pain. This time is so bad that she calls 911. It turns out that one of her ovaries must be removed. Jed gets beeps by the hospital, and Matthew tells him that she is four weeks pregnant. At the station, Andy gets cleared by that sample right before he gets the call about the emergency. When he gets to the hospital, Jed tells him what happened. Sadly, the baby didn't make it. Also, there's something wrong with the second ovary. That means Andy has a tough choice to make now. If Jed removes the second one, that ends their dream of becoming parents. But if he doesn't, there is a considerable risk for Tracy. Andy tells him to save her. But when he gets back in the operating room, we see the situation is not so clear. The remaining ovary may still be viable. Matthew is brave enough to speak up against the decision to take it out. He wants to wait for the results that can confirm the situation, but Jed says he won't take that risk. When those results finally come, they prove that Matthew was right. Too late, though. The removal of a healthy ovary won't look good for the hospital, so Dr. Sullivan suggests burning the report. However, Jed still stands by his decision. He says it was a judgment call, and he didn't do anything wrong. Tracy doesn't feel like that. She decides to take Jed to court. And because Andy gave him permission to go ahead, she also decides that she can't keep forgiving him over and over again. Talking to an attorney about the lawsuit, Sullivan is told to find a hot shot to confirm Jed's surgical expertise. They get Dr. Kessler from Harvard. Compared to Jed's team, Dennis Riley looks a bit juvenile, but he proves to be more than capable. Dr. Kessler's testimony is ruined by his own words. Riley reads from an internal evaluation where he declares that Jed's skill is outshined by his God complex. Kessler tries to minimize the meaning of the expression, but it obviously involves an excess of confidence, just the kind of thing that makes a person ignore good advice at crucial moments, like whether or not to remove an ovary. Jed makes everything even worse by interrupting the lawyers to say that it's not a god complex when you are a god. 
Most prayers are about the well-being of a loved one, and they are answered by fantastic surgeons like him. His lawyer is ready to settle after such a demonstration of arrogance, and Jed doesn't even stay to hear it. That's when Riley says there's more. Jed was drunk when the hospital beeped him, and the bartender is delighted to share it with the world. As they leave, Riley tells Tracy that she will get $20 million. At the women's college, Andy is grading papers in the evening to avoid the solitude of his home. Looking for a light bulb, which is apparently kept in a dungeon for some reason, he happens to find what looks like a bedroom. He begins to inspect the hair locks inside a creepy box when the janitor arrives with a jump scare. Mr. Lemus explains that his landlady kicked him out and this arrangement is temporary. Oh, and the hair belongs to his late mother, that nice lady in the picture. Andy pretends to believe that and tries to leave, but Lemus attacks him. After a brief fight, Andy knocks him out with a fire extinguisher. When Donna says she'll buy him a drink, that sounds like the least she can do. But she's only preparing him for more terrible news. Remember that sperm sample he provided after Paula's murder? The full report came in, and it says Andy is sterile. Tracy was carrying someone else's baby. Instead of confronting her, Andy decides to see Jed. He wants to help him destroy her credibility, and maybe even win the case. Jed's response is surprisingly wise. He tells Andy to quit whining. Whatever conjugal crime she may have committed, it doesn't compare to losing an organ. Tracy still got it worse than everyone in this story. Abandoned by his bestie, he barges into Riley's office, shouting accusations. The lawyer calmly denies everything and refuses to tell him what Tracy is. But all that attorney-client confidentiality can't prevent a slip of the tongue. When Riley suggests other people he can talk to, he mentions Tracy's mother. You know, the dead one. Realizing how much he's been lied to, Andy has such a hopeless look in his face that Riley takes pity on him and says he should bribe the old lady with scotch. It works like a charm. Tracy's mother is a piece of work, but she's happy to rat on her daughter, who expects her to be satisfied with that fake digus on the shelf. She tells him that Tracy is a con artist. After a failed attempt to marry Rich, she had to get an abortion and ended up working for the doctor. Then she skipped town with 80 grand from the clinic. Suspecting that the doctor might be Lillian Field, Andy drives to Boston that same night. The doctor's house is on the top of a cliff that seems taken directly from a horror movie. Looking through the window, he can see another fake digus in the living room. Andy sneaks into the back door and hides in a dark corner. It's not long before Tracy arrives with her mysterious lover. And he's actually Jed, of course. Only Andy is surprised by now. He even gets to hear some of their dirty talk before driving all the way back home. Smashing her picture is the best he can do for his pride at the moment. At least that helps him find a hidden syringe. He also sees poor Billy was innocent, as he's still playing the keyboard by the window when there's nothing to see in their bedroom. So far, Tracy has no idea that Andy has managed to dig that deep. She's walking with Jed on the beach and planning the amazing future they're about to buy with those 20 million from St. Agnes Hospital. Not bad for a pair of ovaries. But the romance is killed when she sits on a syringe and Jed figures out that Andy is on to them. He begins to yell at Tracy, blaming her for the pregnancy. She thought that would double the money. And it might have. But it also jeopardized the whole scam because they didn't know Andy was sterile. We can see from the way Jed is shouting all of this at Tracy that the God complex was not part of the act. She tells him she'll take care of her ex-husband. They meet at a restaurant. Andy can see that he is talking to the real Tracy now, for the first time. She mentions the needle in her bed and warns him that whoever left it there is playing with fire. This is way out of a poor little professor's league, but now it's her turn to be surprised. Andy replies in a firm tone that he is running the show now. He knows that the ovarian cyst was created by the massive amounts of a drug called Pergonal. And even if most of it is gone with the ovary or dissolved, he also knows that Jed gave her the injections himself. That part was a courtesy from little Billy next door. The boy saw everything. 
Andy makes sure to tell her that his new will mentions Billy too, just in case something bad happens to him. Furious and distressed, Tracy asks him what he wants from them. He asks for that fake statue that seems to pop everywhere. Just kidding, he wants 10 million. Time to break the news to Dr. Frankenstein. He agrees to buy Andy's silence to avoid prison, but Tracy doesn't want to hear about splitting the money with one more person who had no ovaries to chip in. She says Billy is the whole case against them. Andy doesn't have anything concrete, except for the witness. Even Jed is shocked to realize what she is asking him to do. Tracy begins to rant about his selective integrity, and he shuts her up with a slap. And that's the last mistake he'll ever make, as Tracy pulls out a gun and puts him out of his misery. Pretty mortal for a god, right? Her next stop is at Billy's. His mom leaves at the usual time and goes to work. Tracy calls Andy and says she has the money. She asks him to meet at Market Square in 15 minutes. She watches him get in the car and waits until he's gone before breaking in. Tiptoeing to the second floor, she gets to Billy's room. But when she's about to wrap his face in plastic like a leftover, she finds herself attacking a dummy. So when Andy shows up at the door, she takes it out on him. They fall from the upper floor and she tries to grab something to hit his head, but a nurse's shoe stops her. It's Dana Harris, dressed like Billy's mom. And when you think it can't get any worse for Tracy, she gets to see the real neighbors getting back as she's getting arrested. The boy is blind. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 1993 movie Malice by Castle Rock Entertainment, starring Nicole Kidman and Alec Baldwin. So, did you find any plot holes? Which character did you dislike? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag cinema recap. Until next time.